Get our Bibles out. Let's raise the word of God high together. Say this with me. This is my Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and hide its words in my heart that I may not sin against God. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray in this moment that we will prepare our hearts to hear your voice. That the things that you would speak to the church of Sardis will be things that we will heed, that we will understand, that we will learn from so we do not repeat the mistakes that they made so that we can be a church that serves you, loves you, follows you, and a church that truly is alive by your spirit. I pray this day that each one in this room will know that you are the risen Lord Jesus, that you are alive, and that you are the God that gives us all life, and that we will realize you have not created us to walk around this earth as a corpse, that is dead in sin, but is a risen believer, a new creation, fearfully and wonderfully made to carry out your purposes here on this earth and throughout all eternity. May you breathe life into us. If we have dry bones this day, God, may you bring them together and place flesh upon them and breathe life into them. Make this church vibrant and arisen and alive and focused vibrant and beautiful as you've always intended us to be. I pray this in Christ's name and everybody said, amen. How important is church to you? It's a good question, isn't it? Some of us have gone to church our whole lives. Yes? Some of us have ventured into church later in our years. And sometimes we don't give a great thought. I mean, do you realize I've preached, this will be the fifth sermon on just talking about the church. Some of you would have been like, how can you talk about the church in five sermons? There's a bad echo, John. Some of us come here because we think it's moral, it's good, it's ethical, it teaches us how to live a good life. By the way, if you're here just for that reason, you're here for the wrong reason. Some of us go through the motions, and some of you fool me. I don't know your heart, and you can put on a good show and make me think you're, 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 you're walking right with Jesus, and you may not be. But some of us in this room, and I hope most of us in this room, we get it right. And we want to be a part of something that's greater than ourselves. And we want to be a part of something that transcends this temporal world that has an internal impact. That's how I wanna live my life. How about you? Do you know that the only institution, I don't even know if it's an institution because it's really a body that exists on this earth that can do that is the church. That's it. No charity. OCC's good, but that won't do that for you. Vacation Bible School, that's good. Lifeway's a great organization. There's a lot of good Samaritan's Purse, so you can go down a list of charities. CareNet, all good charities, right? But only the church. Everything else is an extension of the church. That's amazing. Even as messed up as we are, isn't that amazing? <laughs> that God would use something like the church, the body, a bunch of people that profess Christ, that are baptized, that believe in him and want to live for him, to come together, and God says, I can do great things through that. That's a church I want to belong to. Now, you're going to read today in just a moment, as we've looked at these five, now the fifth church, we've got two more to go after this, that all of them had problems, right? I mean, so far only one really has been no, no criticism of God at all. They were found rich. And next week you're going to find that the church of Philadelphia is just filled with love and God has no criticism for them either. But every other church, there's criticisms. There's compliments, but there's criticisms. And I love it because God is teaching us in these love letters to the churches 
that he's not a critic of us. That's not his job. His job is that he wants to warn us so that we fulfill our great purpose. Does everybody get that? Someone can correct you out of love, and if they do it the right way, it doesn't feel like punishment. And that's what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to get them to wake up, and you're going to hear that in this text today. Wake up, church of Jesus Christ, and be alive. That's what he wants. Now, you can go through church all your life, and you may never hear that message. Yes, we'll say, he is risen, and you will say? See? Can lead you right into that. God is good? And all the time? Now, let's see if you're really on your A game today. God is on the move. And hallelujah. Man, you've learned something. Most of you can recite, this is my Bible now, right? You're quoting scripture, by the way, if you didn't know that from Psalm 119. Every week. Probably most of you can say the Lord's Prayer. Maybe about half of you can quote Psalm 23 verbatim, probably. But is our heart transformed as a church? Are we alive in Christ? That's a question you've got to ask yourself. That's a question we've got to ask as Lexington Park Baptist Church. Because as your pastor, that's what I hope we see. That's what I hope we discover. I hope we discover this vibrancy that's in us that's so contagious that people want it. Not because we're the church that's happening now. You guys seen those? Not because, hey, lights, by the way, there's nothing wrong with lights and, 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 and technology. Those can all be used good for God's glory. Hymns or contemporary music, that's not what this is about. But are we a mile wide and an inch deep? Are we a mile wide and a mile deep? Are we really being the church he wants us to be? Are we just Sunday Christians? Or now are we going to just be Sunday and Wednesday because pastor's making a big deal about Wednesday? Or are we going to be Christians that live it out and we realize every time we leave this place, we are at our best? Think about what I just said there. When we leave this place, we are at our best. Because when you leave this place, it's like leaving a pep rally to go onto a, to a field to win a game, and it's a battle that Christ has called you to. It's real. And you can't do it if you're walking around dead. You can't do it if you're still in bondage to your sin. You cannot be victorious if you've not surrendered every aspect of your life to Jesus. The church in Sardis didn't get it. They thought they were alive, but Jesus saw that they were dead. May God never speak those words to this church ever. Amen? May you never hear him say to you, you think you're so alive, but what I see is so repulsive. It's like a rotting corpse. You're going to hear me use language like that today. God does not want that. God wants us to be alive. So let's look at his word. Let's look at the church of Sardis in chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 down through 6. And the angel of the church in Sardis writes, The word of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it. Repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in the Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus with white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." May God add a blessing to his holy word. So I've been teaching you about these churches, and the church in Sardis really existed in the first century. It was a real church. It had these problems that Jesus is talking about to them. They also represent a time period that we would know as the Reformation. If you were in here, and you did not get this by now, you are a product of the Protestant Reformation. 
The church got it so wrong that Jesus looked at them and said, you are dead, and out of that death, he birthed the church. Now, I know that this is Catholic country, and you probably have Catholic friends, and some of you may have Catholic background, and you may be, uh, maybe even you're still struggling trying to find the truth and everything, and you're a Catholic that's visiting today. Please do not take offense to this, but you should have learned this in school. The Protestant Reformation means that we protest something. Protest, Protestant. What did we protest? The Catholic Church had gotten so bad it could not be purified from within that the Reformers birthed the real church out of it. It's a refining fire. There were some things that came through this birthing which was solo scriptura. Scripture alone is God breathed. The all sufficiency of Christ, that it's Christ alone, that we are saved by grace, not by works. Those are the three primary things. And then the priesthood of the believer, that each person has direct access to God through Jesus Christ. Those four movements are what birth what we are today. Those four movements are the remnant that God speaks of in this text that would come out of Sardis, that would remain true to Jesus Christ, that the doctrines would become pure. By the way, that's not true. Some Protestant churches today have done what? They have blasphemed God. They have turned from true doctrine. And now a new remnant has even emerged within that, if you will, a, a trueness of remaining true to what the Protestant Reformation is about. And what that means to stay true to God's word, to stay true to Jesus Christ, and to be the priesthood of believers that solely relies upon the word of God. That is what the church is supposed to do. If you look through history, we get it wrong a lot, don't we? But I'm going to tell you, anytime you take the word of God out of your life, anytime you take Christ out of your life, Anytime you fail to realize that you have direct access to Jesus Christ, no matter where you are at, God will hear you. If you're saved by him, you have direct access to him. Anytime we deny those things, anytime you walk away from those things, you are like a corpse. Decaying within your spiritual being, not usable by God. Who wants to sign up for that church? You know, that's a lot of churches in America. Do you know that 90% roughly of churches are in decline, plateau, or dying? Wow. Why is that? Why has the church become lifeless in America? Not the church is happening now. We know those, right? We see them. We see the people that teach the itchy ears. By the way, I don't think I'm it tickling your ears right now, am I? Well, some of you are laughing. I hope not. This is some deep stuff. This is stuff that's like, wow. So let's look at what Jesus has to say here about this then. As he says about the seven spirits and the seven stars, what are they? The seven spirits represents the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when you see the, name, the number seven, it doesn't mean seven. It may mean whole or complete or holy. And in this case, we're dealing with Jesus is assigned who? He is assigned the seven spirits, the Holy Spirit of God and the seven stars. And the seven stars are the messengers of the churches, the angelic beings and the preachers to preach God's truth in this time period. So Jesus is reminding the church of Sardis what he said back in chapter one that we read a long time ago, several weeks ago, that you need to realize who I am and that my spirit is among you and it's here to quicken you. And what does the Holy Spirit do? It brings you to life. In Ezekiel's day, he talks of dry bones, now, I know he might not have been thinking about the church, but I think it really fits. Sometimes the church can become so brittle and so dry, it becomes lifeless. We become so caught up in our rituals that we forget the God who breathes life into us. We can get so caught up in the business of our lives that we fail to truly see what God wants us to do and be. May we never get to that point. But if we do, may we beg, may we thirst, may we hunger for God to breathe upon us so that we may have life again. Think about it. Jesus took dirt and breathed on it and made Adam. Do you not think he can breathe on his church and give it life again? You ever seen a flame that's going out 
This is, this is just so awesome. I know there's a scientific way, but think about it. You think blowing on an ember would do what? Put it out. But what's it do? It can ignite it. What Jesus can do with us by just blowing on us, just by just breathing on us, sending his spirit and his message to us. So in verses one and four would be the part that, if you want to call it a compliment, I don't know that it's much of a compliment, but in verse one, he goes on towards the end of it, and he says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive. In other words, the world looks at you and thinks, oh, you got it all together. You're a Christian. You, you think the church is, is perfect. You've got power now. You've, you've made it. You know, you're successful. You've got a nice building, you know. You've got all this stuff. And look, you've got a bunch of, you've got some empty seats, but you're pretty full. You're doing a good job. But Jesus looks down upon the situation of the church and he sees something different than we see. He sees death. And this is really important and it's hard. Anybody ever done self-evaluation of themselves? I mean, one where you're really serious and it hurts. It gets painful. This church refused to see who they really were. They only wanted to see the glamour of who they were and they couldn't see what was really underneath. And they were dead. They weren't alive. I think of Jesus said that to me. I just, I can't even fathom it. I don't want to even go there. But sometimes we need to have these moments where we look at ourselves as a church, where we look at ourselves as a people, and we go, are we really alive for God? Sardis didn't do that. And so God saw them and saw that they were dead. And then in verse four, he does give a compliment. He knows that there are a few people there's a remnant. Do you know God will always work with his remnant? He does. Look throughout the scriptures. Anytime there's people that will bow their knee to him, that will confess their sin to him, that will weep over the sin of the world, that will cry out to him in truth and spirit and want to serve him, he will be there to use them, no matter what they go through. It's been consistently throughout scripture. Now, it's good when we're on top of the world, right? But when you become that remnant, what happens? It becomes more difficult. We're not here to have a reputation where the world loves us. If the world loves us, it's because they love Jesus. If the world hates us, it's because we love Jesus. And Jesus told us we may have it both ways, didn't he? In fact, he warned us. Somebody hates you and you're doing it for righteousness, they really hate me first. Blessed are you, and this is a painful one, who is persecuted for righteousness' sake. Wow. Most of us, I, I'm, I don't like persecution. I don't consider that a blessing, but God says if those moments are right, if you're that remnant, if you're that person that stands and fills that gap for me, then I consider you righteous and I consider you blessed even if you're persecuted. So Jesus gives us a wake-up call. Wake up, church. Wake up. Now listen, who of you has teenagers in here and you go down and you say, wake up. And they go, yes. <laughs> it's good morning time to get up. I can remember this summer, Samuel had to get up kind of early and I walked in and I said, Samuel, time to get up. And he goes, just shoot me. <laughs> wow. At least he's honest, right? That's what the church is like here though. We're so dead. We don't want to be awakened. And God wants us to be awakened. God wants to quicken our spirit. So listen to what he says. Strengthen what remains. This is the commands he's given. Strengthen what remains. What's he talking about? There is still a truth of doctrine. Strengthen what is true. Build on those things, church, and you will be alive. He's telling them, you can look back and see the things that are true and the things that are false. Strengthening those things that remain that are true. For us, strengthening the things like the word of God, being committed to Christ, knowing that salvation is by grace, not by works, knowing that we have direct access to the Father and I don't wear a collar because I'm not a priest because you're your own priest. Those type of concepts. Build on the things that are true about me and about my church, and you'll be okay. So God says, strengthen. Then he goes on and he says, remember. Do you know God says to remember a lot? One of the ordinances of the church is what? 
the Lord's Supper, the baptism is the second one. If you didn't know that, that's part of the quiz you will get in the new t- newcomers class. What are the two ordinances of the church? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. That's it. We don't have sacraments because the, the rituals we do do not impute salvation upon us. Grace does that through Jesus. It's by our faith we become justified. Not by a ritual, not by going through some sacrament, but by belief in Christ. So the ordinances are the things he's commanded. Remembrance is one of the things he calls us to do every time we come to the Lord's table. Remember what I did for you. Remember who I am. So I just want to challenge you. If you're in a dark place in your life, if you're like this walking corpse, like this church in Sardis, remember who he is. Remember. Remembrance will lead you back to him, what he has done for you, that he loves you, that he died for you, that he wants you to be alive. Wake up, church of Jesus Christ. Remember who I am is his command. Then he goes on beyond that and he says, obey. Obey what? Obey my word. Obey me. Jesus says that if you love me, you'll keep my commands. We don't like to hear that. Everybody says, oh, Jesus just loves me. Everything's okay, and it is. He will love you no matter what you do. But if you love him, it says you will keep his commands. Obey. Obey Jesus. Obey the word of God. Does that mean you're going to get it perfect? Absolutely not. And I'm a walking example in front of you telling you, I'm not perfect, and you haven't figured that out. In four months, I have fooled you really good. None of us in this room. But what it does mean is that our striving out of love should be to obey God because he loved us so much, we want to love him back. See, we're not compelled to be obedient out of works. We're compelled to be obedient out of grace. If you get that, that's a huge, that's a big turn when you get that. When you understand it's not about what you have done that earns God's love. He's already given that. But because he loved you so much and what he did for you, you serve him out of that love. Not out of a desire to earn it. You've already got it because you can't earn it. That's why it's called grace. Everybody get that? The church messed that up back in 16th century. They didn't get it. It started being about indulgences and paying this and going to confession booths and all kinds of works. And the church still struggles with it to the day. Even the Protestant church, it is about grace. It's about obedience motivated by grace. Then he goes on to give another thing. He says, repent. Repent. Repent means to turn. So what are we turning from? We're turning from our own man-made ways. We're turning from our sin and our self and our selfishness, and we're turning to Christ. That means we do a U-turn. I've already talked about that. Maryland has more U-turns than any place I've ever been in the United States of America. So every time you drive by U-turn, think, repent to Jesus, repent to Jesus, repent to Jesus. Oh, I just missed my U-turn. That's okay. There's another one coming up, amen? And Jesus will do the same thing for you. He'll give you opportunity after opportunity to repent and turn back to him. So our wake-up call to be strengthened in the things that are true, to be remembrance of who he is and to obey him and to repent and turn to him. If we do those things as a church, if we do those things as believers of Jesus Christ, the consequence that he gives us here is pretty awesome. I think this is almost the best consequence out of any of the churches. These three things, I hope, happen to every single person in this room. So if we look down at verse 5, the one who conquers will be clothed in white garments. I will never blot his name out of the book of life, and I will confess him before my Father and before the angels. I want Jesus to do that for me. Do you want him to do that for you? That's pretty awesome. Let's unpack what this really means. Okay, so the first thing is, those who are overcomers and do do not give in to becoming this dead corpse and just totally refuse all that God is and we embrace him and we live for him and we're trying to stay true to him, listen to what he says, I will give you a white robe. It means righteousness. It means purity. Now, we've already confessed there's no one righteous. The Bible tells us that. 
And if we all self-evaluate ourselves in this room, we all know that right now we stand in here, even if we're a believer in Jesus Christ, we're a sinner and we are guilty at some time in our life. So how can we, who are sinful, become pure and righteous? Here's the answer. You can't. But Jesus can So what the Bible tells us, and you can look this up in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it tells us that he who knew no sin became sin so that we might be made righteous. It is by Jesus' righteousness, it's by what Jesus has done that can make you righteous. It's because he who did not know sin became sin, your sin, my sin, bore that on a cross, died for it, released us from bondage so that we could be alive. That's like goosebumps. That's like awesome. God will do that for me. He'll clothe me in a white garment, a white robe, even though I'm unworthy of it. And he'll make me righteous. God's word said it right there. Second thing he tells us he will do, he won't blot your name out of the book of life. Now watch out, got some of you that struggle with this probably. You can't lose your salvation. That's not what this text means. What he's saying is when your name's in there, there's no removing it. If your name is in the book of life, you need to have the assurance that your name will always be there. And here's what's going to happen someday. You're going to stand before God the Father, and he's going to call your name. Jesus, when he's judging you, he's going to say, you are my child. Not by what you have done, but because what he has done, and you accepted it. You embraced the life-giving power of Christ. You allowed his spirit to quicken you, and you became a child of God. You became adopted. If you are adopted in here, you need to consider yourself awesome in God because God has given you a literal example of what he's done in his kingdom. He loved you enough, though you were orphaned, though you were abandoned, he came and loved you and took you as his own. You and me. To call us by name. Now look out because I'm going to have you do something weird here in a minute. But the last thing I want you to see is in Luke 12, 8. For all those that are written in the books, Lamb's book of life, He will profess your name before the Father and all the angels of heaven. For those who do not profess his name, though, he cannot profess your name before the Father and all the angels of heaven. So for all of us that profess Jesus as Lord and Savior, he guarantees you this one thing. I will profess your name. Your name. Before God the Father, and before my angels. I want every eye closed for a moment. There is something powerful about a name. So I want you to visualize yourself. You've died. You're standing before God the Father. The Son is there, and he's about to judge you. And he says your name. On the count of three, I want everybody to say their name. I know this is weird. Just follow me for a minute. One, two, three. Chris. Let's try that again. Say it loud. Say say it like you want Jesus to say it like your life depends on it. One, two, three. Chris. And on the count of three, I want you to say thank you, Jesus, as loud as you can. One, two, three. Thank you, Jesus. Now, so nobody feels awkward, you can look up. How does it feel to say your name and think Jesus is going to say that? I got one of you. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is really on the move today, Sharon. Amen. How does that make you feel? Jesus is going to say your name. I'm going to get you there someday. We're going to to get there. It's okay to be excited about church. It's okay to be alive. It's okay to know that God is quickening you and to bring excitement to you, enthusiasm to you, and encouragement to you, and energy to you. Now, I know some of us have farther to go than others. We can let Anibal and Fred and myself stay right where we're at, and we'll be okay, all right? The rest of you catch up with us, amen? All right, yeah, amen? I'll throw a couple more of you in there eventually too, okay? We're working on Pastor Joe. We're gonna get him there too. It's okay. We should really be excited about this kind of stuff because in a world that is so messed up and our lives that have so much going on, 
Isn't it a beautiful thing to know that if I'm in Jesus, what I just read out of Sardis, the good stuff, that belongs to you and me. Now, if you've never experienced that in your life, if you've never bowed your knee to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you will not have a white robe. Your name will not be in the Lamb's book of life, and he will not be able to say your name. Chris, you're being so judging. Remember, God's judgments are not my judgments, they're his. If Jesus said that, then you need to ask yourself, how do I get that white robe? Not by what I do, because I just told you it's by what Jesus did. How is my name written in the book of life? It's by the blood of the Lamb of God who writes your name in there when you become saved. And it says that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the earth. Therefore, we are predestined. Christ already knows who will and will not accept him. Your name's there. Or it's not there. And then the last one. Do you want to hear him call your name? I do. I want to convince everyone today, walking up here is not a magical potion. Walking up here will not save you. But today, if you need to profess Christ as Lord and Savior, if you want him to say your name before God the Father and all of the angels, if you want to have eternal life and you want to ask God, I want to repent, I want to, I want to remember who you are and know who you are and I want to live for you and I want to be alive for you, if that's what you want for your life, then today, you know, actually you can have that. You can actually come forward, and all coming forward means is that somebody standing up here is going to help guide you through how you ask Jesus to come into your life. That's all it is. Nothing scary. Pastor Joe's not going to ask you all the points of, uh, of the tulip of Calvinism. We're not going to do that yet, okay? We're not going to do those type of things. We're not going to tell you to, to you know, tell me your, your theo theological view of eschatology. I, I really, at this point, we just want to know if your heart's with Jesus. That's it. That's it. Some of you may need to do business with God. There might be some stuff going on in your life and you need to come up and you need to pray. You need to cry. You need to weep. When's the last time you wept over God's word because you know your heart's broken and you've broken his? Maybe today you've heard something fresh that said, I, 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 I know I'm not dead, but I'm like Samuel in that bed and God's saying, wake up and you're just like, shoot me, God. No, get up, be alive. Go forth and do what Christ has called you to do. Just do business and say, God, I'm sorry. Pick me up and let me soar again for you. He'll do it. I've seen him do it. You gotta believe it. As a church, we need to be praying about this. God, make us alive. Now I know, I don't know exactly what that looks like, nor do you. But Jesus tells us what a dead church looks like. And Jesus has given us some things that we need to make sure we're about. Strengthening each other. Remembering him. Obeying him. Walking with him. Following him. Obeying him. Repenting to him. Those are things we should see in each other and going on in our church and our lives. And if we see those things, those are evidence of life. Not death. So let's pray for our church to have these things. Let's pray that these things in our lives. And if anyone needs to receive Jesus Christ today by his spirit that is here, may he prompt you to have the courage to get out of that pew here in a moment as we sing a song and come forward. Let's close our head and pray. Prepare our hearts. Father God, as we draw to a close today, we thank you for the gift of the church of Sardis. We know that whatever they went through must have been complicated to have you speak these words to them. God, may our ears never hear these words, but if we're hearing it today, my child, arise. You're walking like you're dead. Then may we respond to you and be more than conquerors. Today, if we have never known you, may we come for the first time to receive that white robe and our name in your book and may we know that we have eternity and you're gonna call our name out someday. Father, may we have confidence in what Christ has done. May we live as a church that is not hopeless or lifeless, but may we be a church that's filled with people who love you with all they are 
And may this be a church that doesn't have a reputation of being alive, but a church that is alive. I pray this in Christ's name. And everybody said, amen. Amen.